you very much, Joshua. And I want to thank you very much also for organizing thank the you. conference. Many people have said this. Uh, we you. know it was really, much. really hard to do that. And, and on the last day, I can also say it was a success. Yeah, thank so you so much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot for organizing thank this. And, um, and the other organizers too. Yeah, thank but you. I'm sure you... Uh, it's 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 a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And then, okay. So th my talk will be about a series of papers, um, partly written in collaboration with my former PhD student Sanjib Day, and Thilat uh, Rajan uh, Mathanarajan. He was a um, Erasmus visiting student from Sri Lanka to City University, he participated also in his first two works. I will be mainly talking about these last three, um, but to set the scene a bit, I will also talk a little bit about the first ones. And it's all about um, ET, uh, e E2 Euclidean algebras, or Euclidean algebras in general, e E2 is the first one, and as a warning I should say uh, it has nothing to do with exceptional Lie algebras. I was asked this question several times. So in this context, E7 is not E7. Uh, it's it's a Euclidean Lie algebra. So why should we uh, study this, or wha what is interesting? And there are two motivations for this. One is rather mathematical. Yeah? So most of the exactly or quasi-exactly solved models, they can be related in uh, some way to SL2 R Lie algebras. And uh, the key feature is always they have solutions of hypergeometric type and their specializations. Yeah? <coughs> but there are also models we know. Um, they have different types of solutions and they are based on Matthew functions. And the Matthew function does not fall in this class. So this, the question is what is the Lie algebraic setting, natural Lie algebraic setting for these theories? Uh, so this is just mathematical. Uh, motivation. <coughs> but there's also a physics motivation behind. Yeah? So we know that if you then specialize these models, uh, you pick particular representations and so on, um, they will be applicable in optics. So there are many examples um, which uh, are very popular in the optic studies. Yeah? And what I learned in, in Palermo um, from Kasuki Kanki is the complex Matthew equation, which is part of this large family, corresponds to the eigenvalue equation of a collision operator in a 2D Lorentz gas. Yeah, he was so kind to send me a PhD thesis by Zili Zhang from Texas University, and it's a lengthy uh, derivation to, to derive this. I didn't follow this all through, but at the end, the final equation is really uh, the complex Matthew equation. So that's another very important physical motivation. And the point is, the complex Matthew equation is also not well understood. So these are the two uh, strains, whatever you prefer, uh, you pick your motivation. Yeah. So how does it work in the standard scenario? Well, um, what, what, we, what we studied a while ago is you set up some some Hamiltonian, and you just express it in terms of your preferred algebra. In this case, it's SL2R. Here are the uh, commutation relations. And uh, you write down um, a Hamiltonian uh, of a very, very generic form, have some generic uh, constants here, and you can sort of rescale it to make the PT symmetry really visible. Um, and um, then you can go through your standard program, find um, um, Hermitian counterparts and find the metric and the usual story. So as an example here, if you specify some of these constants, some of these uh, very popular and, and well-known potentials uh, which have been studied pop out. But this is a very general framework and if you have a very general expression for your similarity transformation, this just pops out at a particular, as a particular example. And this I looked at uh, with also a former PhD student quite a while ago, and this we understood very well. This is not what I will be talking about, but this, there's an analogy now. Yeah, so now we just do this for the Euclidean algebra. Yeah, so here are 
the commutation relations. Yeah, there are three generators for, for E2, and two of them commute, and the other two have uh, the, the following relations here um, with your third generator. And you can pick particular representations. This one is used um, in, in some string theory papers when you quantize strings on a Tori. Uh, that's where people also use this, and you just pick U as a sine, the V as a cosine, and the J is some derivative uh, with an I in front, minus I in front. You can also have two-dimensional representations you can find. So here's one, I just pick UX and, um, and VY, and of course they commute, and then I, I choose my J in this way, where these are just standard um, canonical variables. Or you swap the roles, I pick U as PY and V as PX, that's also possible. And now I just do the same as I um, told you before. I um, look for PT symmetries, and there are many PT symmetries. Yeah? I just need some antilinear symmetry, which leaves this algebra, uh, this algebra invariant. So one, for instance, is you just send all your generators to minus and I to minus. So if you go back, if you just send them all to minus, so here I have two, this is compensated here, the same happens here, and here I just have two generators on the left-hand side, and um, this will be fine. Yeah. But, but there are other ones, yeah, and this is not just formal, they give you different physics. Yeah. If you implement them, you get different types of behavior. Yeah. So I will pick one here in particular, we don't treat them all, yeah. Um, I, I will pick uh, later on this one here, PT3, so where you actually permute. I just send J to J, and I'm permuting the U and the V. And of course, I goes always to minus I. Yeah. So all these symmetries leave your algebra invariant, and they are antilinear because of this. Yeah. And that's all you need. Yeah. So I got some complaints to that this should not be called PT anymore, because, but I think... Uh, <laughs> That, that's the natural setting. I mean, they're antilinear symmetries, and, and they're all in this, in this context. We like to call them PT. Yeah, so. And um, then you do what I told you before. We write down a generic Hamiltonian. So for PT1, yeah, I, I send all of them uh, to minus. So it's very easy to write down. have some generic uh, constants here. The mu's are all real, uh, and then I need always, if I just have one generator, I have to put an i. If I have an odd number and if I have an even number, um, I will not have an i. Yeah. Very, very easy to do. Yeah. And of course, I can write down uh, Hamiltonians in a similar way for the other symmetries. Yeah. So that's, that's very straightforward to do, and um, they are non-Hermitian in general, yeah. obviously, because of your i's and and, um, but uh, then you can go through the standard procedure and you can find uh, isospectral counterparts. So here's one um, related to PT5, yeah, and I didn't write down there are some, some, um, some constraints on the mu's which you have to respect. I talked about this um, at some other conference, so I will only, this is only to set the scene. This will not be my main main topic, but we have done it for all the other symmetries in this <coughs> case, and you have your similarity transformation, and then if you construct a metric from this, you see very nicely um, how the metric breaks down at the exceptional points, just by, by constructing uh, these type of objects and by implementing uh, your constraints. Yeah. And we also even found, I talked in, in Palermo to Stefan Rotter about it, I told you these models are applicable in the optics context, and we had some nice example, so you specify a few of your parameters and so on, and one which was nicely treatable. We looked at the structure of our PT symmetries, uh, and there's one which we found interesting, you have a switching on and switching off uh, PT symmetry. Yeah? So you, you, you pick one coupling constant, let it run, yeah, and your PT uh, symmetry will be broken. Then you have a regime where you have completely co spontaneously broken P2 
PT symmetry, and then it will be eventually switched on again. You know. And what we actually calculated in our paper, uh, I showed it also to Stefan, uh, is we look at some intensities, and in this regime, um, <laughs> the combination of two intensities is vanishing. Yeah, and if you remember the talk from Philipp Ambichel and Stefan talked about it in Palermo, this is exactly uh, what happened here. Yeah, so this is, for us, this was just a coincidence, but the, 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 this, these people are trying hard to achieve that. Yeah, so you have this naturally in these, in these systems. And here's a particular example. Yeah, so if you specify your uh, constants even further for this one, yeah, so the other ones are also in the paper, but as I said, I just want to use that to set the scene. If you, sp if you set some of them to zero, mu1 is just one, and these ones are also picked uh, in a very, very simple way, uh, you get a potential which has been studied uh, also recently uh, by other people. Yeah. So this is just, this just a special case of this very general scenario. Yes? What is the lambda? <coughs> lambda, yeah, lambda, I didn't specify, um, uh, didn't specify that. Lambda, there, there are various constraints, yeah? And some constraints come from your similarity transformation. Uh, and in your similarity transformation, you have a lambda and a tau. You make the usual ansatz e to the to the um, to the generators, yeah? J U V in this case, and then you can work out the action on your standard generators. Yeah? And this lambda is one of these constants, which is constrained. I also didn't write down the constraining equation. Uh, lambda is not the free parameter. The lambda isn't there in the first place. It's it's determined by the mu's. The mu's are your parameters in your model. Yeah. A good question. I didn't write all the details down and I didn't write all the constraints down. Yeah. So this is old work and um, the point is that you cannot uh, find either spectral pairs, at least not with this ansatz we had and some of the constraints um, exclude very interesting models. Yeah. So you can't always do this or at least not with that ansatz. There might be more complicated ones, but I guess if you can do it, that will be very complicated. Yeah. It's not straightforward to do. And um, one example is the complex Matthew equation. Yeah. So um, if I look at this Hamiltonian, just um, very generically expressed in my generators, and I pick this first representation I showed you, yeah, in cosine and sine and this derivative with respect to theta with an i for the j, then what you get is uh, the complex Matthew equation. So that's, that's an example um, you can pick for this, uh, what I call P1 representation. Uh, is this equation? No, uh, that's not sine Gordon. This is the equation. No, 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 no. It's the Matthew equation. And if you consider instead... Can I, can I just yes, it's sure. It's very interesting. That, that equation, or something almost, almost identical to it, came up a long time ago in some work that I did back in the 1970s with Goralnik and Mandula. I know, I know. Binding, yeah. Which is very strange. It's very strange. Anyway, yeah, sorry. So it's an interesting, Carl just confirmed there's another lots example why this is an interesting things. equation to study. Yeah, I gave you the one of the Lorentz model uh, and the optics and there's, there's something else as well. Yeah. So if we want information about, so this equation isn't well understood. Yeah? So if you, if you want to know where are the exceptional points, not even that is well understood. Yeah? The lowest ones are known but um, this is, is numerical, Floke answer, it's, 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 it's not, the understanding is incomplete. Yeah. So how to get there? We can't uh, ca uh, find a, a similarity transformation. I can't do what I did before. We do not know what is the isospectral pair. No, we, we can't do that. But if I look instead in, thi in this equation, um, I can do a trick uh, these people propose, not in this way, yeah. Um, they looked at particular representations, but I just formulated in a Lie algebraic way. Yeah. So if I take um, a double scaling limit, yeah, so I have here a zeta, 
then of course this term disappears and I assume that zeta n um, will be my g and then I recover this in this double scaling limit. Yeah. So um, I can get some information about um, properties of the Matthew equation from this double scaling limit. Yeah. And Carl was the first one to point out the uh, connection um, of, of the complex Matthew equation to E2. Uh, and I just put this together now. These people propose the um, double scaling limit and on this slide I'm putting this together and formulate this in, in, in a Lie algebraic way. Yeah? So how to do uh, quasi-exactly solvability using um, E2 instead of uh, SL2R? Yeah? Well, the general principle is, is, is this. Yeah? I have uh, some kind of flex structure and I want that my Hamiltonian, and I have some grading, uh, so it's very general, I have some grading and Vn has to go to Vn. No. So I suggest here this kind of graded space. Uh, so you have some, um, some, this will be your ground state uh, wave function, it has to respect, this is now for Pt3, but you can do it of course for all the others as well, it has to re respect your Pt symmetry, and also these, uh, uh, these, uh, these components have to satisfy the symmetry. Yeah? And then you can check, so uh, does it, what, what, what does my operator or what do, what do my generators do when they act on these spaces? Yeah? Because this is what I want in the end. Yeah? So you can pick uh, some PT3 invariant state so in this case, PT3, I just showed it to, for, to you for the algebra. What does it do? It sends all the generators to minor. No, sorry, it, 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 uh, that was PT1. Uh, it, it permutes uh, the U and V, and um, it leaves the J invariant. And um, these kind of states will satisfy this. Uh, and if you plug them in here, then you can see that, for instance, J will send your space NS to um, Vn plus 1c. Yeah? That's obviously not what you want because you are swapping odd and even spaces. Yeah? And the same happens if I have here c and then I go, I go to s. Yeah? And um, the same happens if I take this combination u and v, it will send ns to n plus 1c. And this combination, which we already saw in, in the Hamiltonian, um, is actually a good one yeah? because it sends Vns to Vns plus one. Yeah, it's not it's not n here, but I am I, I can then implement some constraints. So this is a good combination. Yeah. And other good combinations I can of course find if I have here a j squared, then um, I will go also from s here to to s and from c to c. Yeah. So you just do it twice. You cook up combinations so um, that you get something reasonable here on the right hand side. Yeah. And you can also modify your ground state. Yeah? So if I change, if I if I pick here this one in this example, um, then you get some combination here. Yeah? So it's not so elegant anymore. Yeah. And this one is still fine here. The one on the bottom, it's still an S to S. That's the key point n plus one. Yeah? So and if you don't like to work with trigonometric functions, you could also uh, work with polynomials. Yeah, I showed you these other representations. I can hef have here also polynomials in X and Y. Yeah. And um, so um, what does the Hamiltonian which I uh, wrote down do now on these spaces? Well, I just look at this table and, um, and I uh, get this structure. Yeah. So which looks good yeah, because it's an S um, S, 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 yeah, so it's preserved, and, and C, 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 yeah, so that looks fine, yeah, and then of course I have to reduce this down somehow because I want Vn mapping to Vn yeah, for a proper Hamiltonian, yeah. but that's another task, I can implement this, yeah. so I need some constraints on this structure, and then of course we need to implement some quantization, and quantizations uh, happen then at the level n plus 1 and then you end up um, with a structure like this. 
Yeah? So this is n minus 1 half goes to n minus 1 half, s goes to s, c goes to c. Yeah? So this is possible, a possible structure. Yeah? There are more solutions. Yeah? So if you, if you look at, um, at this table, yeah, um, then uh, this combination will also do. Yeah? So uh, I can have um, another possibility um, for quasi exactly solvable model, and also this model has this nice property that it reduces to the Matthew equation. Both of these examples um, reduce to the Matthew equation. And then I can ask another question can I combine these two models? Yeah. So, can I unify these models and have something um, generic? Yeah. So, now I just keep, if you, if you remember the models here, this is one model. And they have this and this term they have in common, and this one differs from model to model. So it was is I have here I have this u square minus v square square term, yeah, and here instead I have this term. Yeah. So I join this up and I keep initially, because we of course we do not know what happens with the constraints, uh, we keep mu and lambda generic, but if you do this, you get a four-term relation. You know? And uh, we want uh, three-term relations, which I explain in a second. You know? But if you restrict, restrict mu, um, the last term in this four-term relation vanishes. And um, if, if I pick mu as, as uh, 2 times 1 minus lambda, um, and then I will end up with a three-term three relation. You know? So there is actually a bigger model now, which has now three constants, n, zeta, and lambda. And I can use lambda to reduce to the other models. Yeah. So for lambda 0, I get one model. For lambda 1, I get the other one. And of course, there is the double scaling limit, which gets rid of both of these terms. And I get uh, the complex Matthew equation. Yeah. And n is the number of states. No n, you are, will specify what n is, because that depends now on the quantization condition. Yeah, and that, that, yeah, that's not just n, n is an integer, n is related to the other constants. Yeah. So I just said this, lambda 0 gives one model and lambda 1 gives the other model. Yeah. So now according to this general scheme, scheme I um, <coughs> make such an ansatz. Yeah. So here is my expansion in this space I described. Yeah, it's spanned by these objects here. Yeah, and then I have some coefficients uh, which will depend on my energy E. Yeah. So I have an odd and an even fundamental solution here. Um, and then there are some constants. And the constants you don't know a priori, the constants you fix in hindsight. Yeah. So in this case, the constant is this. Yeah. So uh, this is um, the Pochhammer symbol, and I pick here a particular uh, state uh, as a ground state, which respects my symmetry PT3. Yeah? And of course, this, uh, this is not part of the ansatz. Yeah? The ansatz is this, and then you see what comes out, and what you want is, as I already told you, we want a three-term relation. Yeah? So, and if I pick, in hindsight, my C like this, I have uh, this uh, three-term relation. Yeah. So if you do not know what, what to put here, which you don't know when you start, you, know, you just have here some uh, generic constant, or even leave it out, yeah, and then uh, rescale your p in such a way uh, that you have nice numbers here. And yes, yes, yes. This will be weekly. This will this will be a weekly orthonormal polynomial in the end. So now I have what I, um, what, uh, what I want, I want uh, and what you always have in, in quasi-exactly solvable models. I mean, it's just an analogy now to the SL2R case. This is now for E2. E yeah, it's just the setup has to be different. Yeah. And um, so this 2, one has to be careful about as a starting equation. There's a 2 here, which does not fit in this general formula. And um, uh, this, this one. Um, this one does, yeah. So the, the odd ones are, are in a way uh, nicer f regarding the structure. So here the i runs from 0 and then the 1 is left out because that's this equation 
and then 2 to infinity, and this one starts at 2. So now we have what we want. We have um, three term relations, and this we can solve. <coughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's easy to do. I pick um, because this was my, the, 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 the phi was my ground state, so I pick P0 to 1. And then you can just uh, iterate it. There's also a nice closed solution. Um, but if you're just interested in the lower states, it's probably easier just to put it on a computer and you just iterate it. That's straightforward. Yeah? Everyone can do this. Yeah? So here's just to give you the flavor. Uh, these are the first examples. Yeah? And I have now almost all the ingredients for what is referred to as quasi-exact solvability. Yeah. So um, there has to be now some level n tilde such that the three-term relation reduces to a two-term relation. Yeah. And if you just look at the structure here, um, you can anticipate this here. I can certainly make this factor vanish and this one as well, yeah. with some constraint, of course. Yeah. And what you also then need is uh, which in a way comes for free, you need that um, when n is larger than this number n tilde, then your polynomials have to factorize. And um, uh, then you want uh, the higher terms to vanish, uh, and you get the quantization from setting um, uh, the, the pn's. Actually, you don't set them. This is not expressed properly. Uh, the pn's have to vanish for n greater n tilde, but this happens automatically due to the factorization. Yeah? <coughs> because this is what we get here. Yeah? So I, I told you, we just looked at the three term relations and the last term has to vanish now, and it vanishes if I um, select my n in this way, yeah? or in this way. Yeah? And then it's easy to see that precisely uh, this structure is respected because then if you look at polynomials um, graded with a number larger than n tilde, yeah, if I look at n tilde plus L, it will factorize in a P n tilde times an RL, and that happens also for the Qs, the same structure. <coughs> yeah. And these Rs here, they are just the same in both cases, and you can easily work them out. Yeah. But they are not that relevant, um, dep well, depending on the question you're asking, um, because uh, for any L yeah, uh, larger than uh, zero, um, this will vanish, because I will set now um, uh, Pn to zero. Yeah. And these are the typical features of what is uh, often referred to as uh, bender dun polynomials. Yeah. Carl did this a while ago. Yeah. Yes. Closed expressions for? Oh, I come to that. I come to that. Yeah. I mean, you mean already here? Yeah. This is. You want this in a closed formula? What? Did I mention this as well? I I didn't succeed here. Yeah. But this is of would of course be nice. Yeah. Have you identified? There are yes. Of course. Yes. Well, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. Yeah. So for the moment, we have a solution. Yeah, we have our ansatz, and we have a solution for our coefficient functions. Yeah. And um, I now set. I now comes the quantization. Yeah. So now I will make all these polynomials vanish. Yeah. So I set uh, P and tilde E, and the E and tilde is a combination of my coupling constants. I set this to zero, and also in this polynomial, and then I get the first state. Yeah, it's just uh, E, uh, the, or, or the, not the state. Well, the state I also have, because now um, I just plug it all into my by wave function, of course. Yeah. So this is the first energy. Second one looks like this, and you see here already uh, a famous square root popping up. And here I have three energies you can still present in the formula. Yeah, so this L here runs from, uh, takes values in 0 plus minus 2. And uh, the omega is, uh, has a relatively ugly form. Yeah. And um, also four states 
um, one can still write down uh, an analytic expression, but it's really ugly, so I don't present it here. Yeah. And <coughs> for higher states, it's not difficult to do it numerically. Yeah. So, and of course, it happens for odd and even. Yeah. So this is my quantization condition. Yeah. And of course, the next question is, what are the exceptional points? Yeah. So this, this, this will become complex here at some stage. Yeah. And also here, I will get something complex. Yeah. And I, you just recall that your discriminant is just the product here of the uh, energy eigenvalues. And so I just compute the zeros of my discriminant. And uh, here are the discriminants. Yeah. So that's easy to compute. Um, but if you compute it this way, you need to know all the energies. There's a nicer way to compute it, namely using um, the, the Sylvester matrix. And that's just defined like this. You have your polynomial. I just write it here down for P, but it's very generic. And then uh, you read of these coefficients. And that's this, this matrix defines your Sylvester matrix. And the determinant of this is, um, uh, is is your discriminant. Yeah. It also popped up in Uwe's talk. Yeah. Uwe mentioned that. Yeah. So here you have an, uh, can have another go at finding closed formulas yeah. <laughs> and put these numbers maybe here in some <laughs> closed expressions. But uh, I succeeded for, for some of them, but not in general. Yeah. So um, these are your exceptional points. And at this point, usually, um, Dieter Heiss is asking, and what happens in the vicinity? Uh, and I usually say, oh, well, not, not, not very much. It's what you expect. And I haven't done it. Yeah. So fortunately, he's not here today. <laughs> but he can, he can watch the video. Dieter, this is for you. <laughs> yeah. So what happens near the exceptional point? Uh, um, what you do is, you um, just calculate a loop um, in your energy plane, yeah? an energy loop. Yeah? So I'm going to some point, um, I'm picking a radius, and then I'm surrounding, in my coupling constant space, I'm surrounding uh, the exceptional point. Yeah? That's, that's what people do. Yeah? And um, also Günther and Holger, they're also not here anymore. Uh, they have also studied this for various models. Yeah. And yes? Yeah? You mean the discriminants or the polynomials? And, and what should be related, the polynomials or the discriminants? <coughs> well, I don't know. There's no specific um, ingredient here from the representation. I, I, I would be careful. Yeah. So what happens? So I'm now in my coupling constant space, and I have two coupling constants, so I could do it in, both, in either of them. Yeah. And I go to to a fixed point, yeah, so I'm picking now here an exceptional point, yeah, so I'm looking at, um, uh, here are the energies, I can show you again, so I'm looking at this energy, and of course, uh, there's an exceptional point here, and um, I didn't write down what I pick for these numbers, yeah, but the exceptional point here, to understand this figure, you need to know the exceptional point is at 9 over 4, they are chosen in a way that you have it uh, at some nice value. And then just the usual thing happens. I surround now the exceptional point, And if I go around once, I'm not back to my end state. I have to pick the other energy. And I have to go around twice to come back to my or original point. Yeah? But I can make the radius larger. So this is a very small one, yeah, 0 0.1. Yeah? And then what happens is the same. And the figure looks a bit more exotic because it is a little twirl here, yes, it goes from 0 to 2, and then goes from 2 to 4 with, uh, uh, on, the other, on the other energy. Yeah. If I make it 
even larger from 3 to 8, uh, I actually have to go around only once. Yeah, I go from 0 uh, to, uh, or, or from 0 to, uh, here I, I extracted the pi. Yeah? So it's from 0 to pi and then to 2 pi, but um, I have to swap already um, at pi to the, uh, to the other energy. Yeah? So that's the uh, somehow uh, a common structure and um, I can get a similar structure in fact if I don't do it at an exceptional point. Yeah. So I now I just pick some energies here. Yeah. Here are the energies yeah, located, uh, one at 0 0.35, one at 3.7. This is not an exceptional point. And I surround this now and uh, I just go back to the origin. Yeah. And this one I also go back and I come back to the origin. Yeah. But if I make my radius larger, um, I just get what I observed before for the exceptional point. Yeah. So <coughs> I go here to 2 pi and now I have to switch. Uh, I'm not back to my ori original uh, point. I have to switch to the other energy and I go back to my original um, uh, uh, starting point. Yeah. And I do it for yet another um, larger radius and in this case, I only have to surround it uh, once, which was the same as for the exceptional points. Yeah. What's the explanation? Oh, it's very easy. Um, we just look at the, um, at the energies. Um, so um, the exceptional points, that's the key, they are branch points. Yeah. So I, in this energy here, I have a branch cut here from um, 1 to infinity and from minus infinity to minus 3. Yeah. And if you're sitting at, an, I can get this structure whatever circle I make here. Yeah. So if I, um, if I look at this circle, yeah, this is not an exceptional point, yeah, you uh, encounter no cut anywhere. Yeah. I, I, I just go around once. Yeah. <coughs> but if I'm at an exceptional point, I have no choice because the exceptional point is a branch cut. Yeah? It's, a, it's a branch point. So however I choose my branch cut, cuts, I will always hit it somehow uh, when I surround the exceptional point because it's a branch point. Uh, so, and you can see this here, yeah, the entire structure can be observed. Uh, so if I'm, if I'm going around here, make my rad radius very large, um, I, when I go from blue to blue, if I want to analytically continue, I have to go to this energy. I have to swap. Yeah. And then I go back and um, I'm in, in the red here and this is also red, yeah, which is precisely this structure. I have to go around only once. Yeah. <coughs> but if I'm choosing a radius which is sort of hitting this only once, this branch cut, uh, and then I go around once and if I want to continue from blue to red, I have to go down here and so I have to surround it twice. Yeah, that's the structure really. Uh, and um, so, so this, this other, if you just look at these pictures, it looks really exotic and, and so on, but this is really the explanation. You just look at these pictures and you completely understand it. It's no problem. And you can do it even having four energies. Yeah, so I'm now looking at, at, uh, at, at, at four energies and I have here some exceptional point and you can construct all kinds of exotic pictures. So here I go around the exceptional points and uh, going around in exceptional points, you never have a choice. I always have to go uh, at least twice. Uh, even if I make my radius smaller, I can't, I can't avoid the cut. Yeah. Um, but over here, I have, um, I'm also encountering a cut. These are not exceptional points and um, you get a similar structure I showed you before. Did you find no, they are all E2s. They are all E2s. Yeah. Um, you can construct something more exotic uh, if you like, uh, just to have something really fancy. Here you have to go around three times. Yeah. So if you start with very slow radius, yeah, then you just have surrounding uh, each of these. So I didn't tell you, I have here now um, a degeneracy, um, a complex degeneracy. Yeah. So e, E1 is equal to E2, so it is this point over here. Uh, and then these other points are just uh, some energies which you get plugging in your constants. Yeah. And now you have to go around three times um, to come back to your origin. Yeah. 
and the explanation is here. Yeah, you have a more complicated branch cut structure and you can follow this through and, and see how it jumps. Yeah. So this is just uh, due to the complicated nature of, of your function. Now, what about some other type of information? I, I said um, something about the complex Matthew equation. I told you the complex Matthew equation isn't well understood, and especially the exceptional points. We do not know precisely where they are. You know, some are computed numerically from the Floquet um, ansatz, and, um, and uh, I can now use here this scheme um, to get that information. And what I do is here, I just look now at my polynomials, I calculate my zeros as I, as I showed you, and I'm calculating the location of the exceptional points just from, from here, yeah? looking at the zeros of these polynomials. And then I have to multiply it with the n I've picked, and now I gradually make n larger. Yeah? And you can see here, these are some known values, numerically known. Um, and you can see uh, this is uh, this is fairly fairly reasonable. Yeah. I didn't make any more sophisticated analysis of the precision, but uh, qualitatively this looks looks very reasonable. Yeah. So, and this is for lambda one. Yeah. This is when one of the terms vanishes. Yeah. So since I can play with lambda, I can ask the question. I have three couplings. Yeah. I have the lambda. Remember, which interpolates between the two models. I have an n. And, um, and my zeta, n goes to infinity here. Yeah. So is there some lambda which is optimal? Yeah. So maybe because I do not know very well my complex Matthew equation, I want a model for some finite values which qualitatively mimics my complex Matthew equation. Maybe in, in one of these applications, I do not need the full equation. Maybe I can mimic it. Yeah. And, and then the question is, uh, which of these models is optimal? So I'm looking now at various values of lambda, and um, I'm checking for one of the exceptional points, just the difference. Yeah. So the delta is here. This is what I expect, and this is what I get on each step here. Yeah. So this, this is, this is uh, basically this, um, this column, yeah. um, but taking off this value here. Yeah. I'm just looking at the difference here. Yeah. And um, you see here, if I just vary, of course, lambda is not restricted, um, but you can see here what happens if I go beyond these limits. Uh, um, it, uh, if, if lambda goes in either of the direction, it gets worse, but lambda 1 is kind of the best fit. Yeah. So that, that's, that selects out a model, um, and, and the similar behavior you get for the other exceptional points, yeah. which is closest to the complex Matthew equation if you want to have sort of finite values. Yeah. So that's my conclusion from here. And um, if you are just interested, maybe you don't want any further information of the model. If you're just interested in the exceptional points, yeah, then the most um, effective way is to take the limit actually directly on the three-term relation. Yeah. So if I assume that this limit holds for my polynomials, yeah, so I'm assuming if I take the double scaling limit, and then um, I will get the p corresponding to the Matthew equation, and I will get the q for the Matthew equation. Uh, that's most optimal, this limit. And then what you get is, of course, an infinite matrix. I, I can re reinterpret then this system as reading it like there's a matrix acting on these states. That's an infinite number. Uh, and then I have to work out um, the eigenvalues for this matrix. Yeah, but since it's infinite, I have to truncate it somehow. Uh, so if I uh, call the rank L, I can now uh, truncate uh, this expression. And then I can do the same. Then I have my energy. And when I have my energy, I can work out the discriminant. And I can work out the exceptional points from the discriminant. Yeah. And again, I multiply it um, with the n I have picked um, on that particular level. Yeah. And then what you get is really very, very nice. It's very precise. Yeah. Um, you see here already for, if this is my desired um, uh, precision, already after four steps by, from a four by four matrix, 
I, I get all the digits. Yeah. So that, that's, that's very efficient. Yeah. And, um, and that carries through. Yeah. So I, I do here an analysis now for, for, higher, for higher rank. So my, I'm increasing now my, my truncation for the matrix. Yeah. And you can see here the ones in bold are um, my criterion is very simple. I don't do anything really very sophisticated. I don't uh, estimate errors or so. Yeah. I'm just, um, my simple criterion is I go to 26 times 26, and if 27 times 27 uh, doesn't differ uh, to that precision, um, then I take it. Yeah. Maybe I look a little bit in the neighborhood. And, and you can see here, uh, there's a nice convergence. So these values, the, f the lowest ones, um, I forgot up to which one um, you can find in the literature, uh, but there are more, I found more which, which are not in the literature, and you can find them already at this simple analysis. Yeah. If you put this on some more sophisticated machine, you can find easily more if, you, if you're interested. Yeah. So these ones I compare, and they fit what you can find in the literature, but there are always some which are not so nice. For instance, here, this one doesn't converge that well. Yeah. And it's not that, of course, you expect the higher you go, um, uh, that, that your convergence will be worse. Yeah. Um, but this already happens here, and then you get, again, nice convergence. So the bold ones are the ones I'm trusting, yeah, but there are ones, some in between, um, which, which are not that good. And that happens for even and odd, yeah, similar ones. Over here, these are the bold ones. They are very nice. Again, here, the lowest one um, you reach already after uh, with a very small ma matrix. Yeah. And um, then here's again one which is funny. Strangely, it's always the fifth one. <laughs> I have no idea. Usually, you'd expect the convergence to be at the low energy level and the poor convergence at high energy. Yes. You have this peculiar structure. That's what I'm saying. I don't know. I don't I don't know. I didn't. I didn't uh, investigate. You can do the. You can do this more sophisticated. That's no question. I just wanted to see how if it comes out, uh, and and you can see here already these numbers here, probably up to from here they are not known in the literature. I didn't find them. You can do all kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. By the way but I have. I have. I have polynomials, so I'm uh, analyzing this. This is here my. It doesn't. Yeah. Mm. The, the convergence is not monotone, is it? Is uh, it? No, I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't do any. Uh, I mean, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's very naive, na very naive numerics. Yeah. Setting, yeah. yeah. It should be monotone down. It should relax down to the correct state. But in the case of a, a PT symmetry, yeah. um, it, it should not be monotone. And it should be sort of bouncing around. Mm. One can do the famous Richardson and all that stuff. I didn't do that. So um, we had a comment: these are um, orthogonal polynomials. Well, they are weakly orthogonal. Yeah. So and this goes all back to a very old paper, 80 years. And what you need is to get weakly orthogonal polynomials. How am I doing with time? Ten yes, um, okay, 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 that's fine, that's fine. So if you have, this is the general setting for this uh, theorem, if you have a three-term relation of this type, yeah, and you have um, for some negative ends your b's are vanishing, and there is some integer k for which your b's are zero, yeah, which is precisely what we implemented, um, and then there exists um, a linear functional L acting on these polynomials such that these um, far ends are orthogonal. Yeah. So this is a general uh, theorem. Yeah. And we have these ingredients, and so I can calculate norms. Yeah. And in fact, you can calculate them in two ways. One is just from your three-term relation. Yeah. I'm just acting on the three-term uh, relation times phi n minus 1 with L, yeah, and then you get um, a simple relation because some of them vanish, and then um, you just get uh, n. Uh, you can just see it from here. Yeah. You just get a simple recursion relation, which you can solve um, by the product of the b's, and the b's are here is the negative 
and the minus sign is taken out for that reason. So it's just a product of these coefficients. Yeah. And um, you could also compute actually the measure. Yeah. You can compute this, and um, there is a paper by uh, Krajewski and other people um, where they propose um, this this formula, and you can calculate this. Yeah. And since there are two ways, that's really nice because then you can check. Yeah. So. Um, for the case at hand, these are the norms. Again, here, this is the Pochhammer symbol. And uh, this, these are the norms for the P's, and these are the norms for the Q's. Yeah. Um, calculated now just from this simple formula. This is just solved. Yeah. And if you plug in numbers, yeah, not surprisingly, um, let's have some uh, number, or not yet. Uh, let, let's postpone this for a second. Um, so I'm also constructing the omegas you know, in order to have uh, this metric here. And there's some constraining equation I didn't write down, but in the Karzewski paper, uh, this is explained um, how, how to determine uh, these omegas. And here they are, just to give you the flavor. And again, these omega, which I introduced before, which popped up um, uh, when I calculated the energy eigenvalues, with some longish co uh, uh, combination uh, pops up here. Yeah. Now, if I now check, yeah, so I have two ways to check it. Once, I once using my omegas, uh, and one is uh, just from uh, this combination. So I can check the ends. Yeah. And not surprisingly, my model is non-Hermitian. Uh, this norm is negative. Yeah. There is, I forgot to say that, this model the original model, um, let's go back so maybe you can even see that, um, has some special subclass. Here's the model. Um, this is the model I'm talking about. Um, when uh, 2n is uh, lambda minus 1, the model is actually Hermitian yeah, for free zeta. Yeah. So that's a nice subclass to check. Uh, what happens to the norm, yeah, and uh, for this entire subclass, um, the norm is positive. Yeah? So that, that's, that's, and con also the convergence to the eigenvalue should be that's consistent. Downward, as it really so that's a nice, nice, nice check uh, for, for some quite large subclass in this case. Yeah? And that's, that came in through the lambda. Yeah? So remember that I said, it's 2n as lambda minus 1. Yeah? So for this one model, namely lambda 1, this doesn't happen. There is no such subclass because the n has to be 0, which is just the lowest level. Yeah? But for the other one, I also observed this, but there was just a point. Yeah? Now it's a whole subclass for this model. And so just to come, come to the end, so here I, I can... I can check this. They are negative, uh, as, as we would expect. What you cannot do in two ways is, of course, to check this. Yeah? For this one, um, I cannot use the first method yeah, because that just gives me the norm. Yeah? It doesn't give me um, uh, that I should get a zero when I have different indices. Yeah? But I can check this now. Yeah? This is uh, giving me confidence the omegas are fine. And this is also consistent with this relation. And you can work out other examples. That's also possible. Yeah. And you can compute momentum functionals also in two alternative ways. But um, I don't present that here. So I just come to the conclusion. Um, so I think I can claim that Euclidean Lie algebras um, provide um, uh, a consistent framework for quasi-exactly solvable models. Yeah. So this is is a viable scheme. I showed you many examples. And um, my one of the motivation was to extract information about the complex Matthew Hamiltonian. And there are various ways to get to various types of information um, from the double scaling limit. Or if you like, you can find an optimal lambda so that you get the qualitative behavior depending on the question you're asking. Yeah. And of course, there's more to do. You can construct more quasi-exactly solvable models by looking at different representations. Now, I did it here for, for uh, um, trigonometric functions, but somehow maybe you would like to do it in terms of polynomials. Pick the other representation, and then you have, of course, polynomials. Um, that will not give you anything new. Of course, that's just a different 
um, uh, different way of, look of, of representing your quantities. Yeah? And of course, I haven't explored all the PT symmetries. Yeah, remember for these similarity transformations, I showed you five different ones just for E2. Yeah? And I have only done it for P3, PT3. Yeah? So, and, but for the similarity transformations, you get really qualitatively different behaviors for the different symmetries. Yeah? And you can see how they are broken. Precisely that symmetry is broken when you reach um, the spontaneously broken regime. So you will get different behavior, I'm sure, if you try different uh, PT symmetries. And of course, more challenging, yeah, this is just uh, very incremental. You just uh, uh, repeat uh, what is done here. But more challenging is if you look at higher rank, if you look at E3 or so. Yeah. And uh, for the similarity transformation, we have done a little bit on E3, but yeah. Uh, uh, that, that's, of course, also possible here. And uh, the experiments I mentioned, um, one can also possibly make uh, more contact to this. Yeah, so, and I want to stop here. Thank you. <coughs> Which one? Yeah. Yeah, but that came already before. I want to show you where this comes from. Uh, the omegas come from here. Yeah. This is just the, 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 the third order. This is the solution of a third order polynomial. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. And that's that's how these omegas entered. Yeah. It's 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 hard to find uh, a nice way of but this is this combination comes always up. In, in the in the even solution and this combination came up in the odd solution so I, this is a way to write it compactly and then you can label all the energies um, with some index yeah. you get the real mess at the beginning and, but this is the best I could do to organize it yeah but it's just the eigen it's just the the, the solution of a third order polynomial Yeah, I can give you, I can show you, not even on one slide, the uh, expression for uh, E4, uh, and the other ones I did numerically. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Let's have lunch. Yeah, but I, uh, speaking of lunch, I suggest mm. that we go there only at around 1, because you remember on Tuesday, it was filled with uh, jeering and cheering and noisy children. It was there? It's uh, in the Sherman building. So I pr propose that we gather at the entrance around one, at one and go together. And uh, hopefully it will be quieter. That the owner of the restaurant suggested that we do that. So I think it's a good idea. Otherwise, we won't be hearing ourselves thinking. And then they serve them at one o'clock. They serve the children. Yes, yes, and then yes, we take, uh, yes, yes, <coughs> yes. So I, I suggest that we meet at one o'clock in the main entrance. Right. And we'll get up. That's more tea. So, yeah.